at that time of the stand, kind of like that, free from. And <clears throat> then with the, the chairs in kind of a half circle around the table, which was a little farther out on that particular Sunday. Uh, the next Sunday, I decided uh, I think I'll do it the same way again. And, um, and then eventually I asked the church board, you know, how do you feel? Should I go back up or should I stay down? Everybody seemed to like being this way. And so it's been that way ever since. The next preacher may prefer to go back up on the upper level, but I prefer to be down here a little closer amongst the folks. And uh, it's worked out pretty well throughout our years. Um, I'll leave the pulpit as a request to the church. I bought this uh, when we found that it was going to be a permanent thing that I'd be at this level. But I didn't like preaching from that stand, and so I got a little better. At dawn, the telephone rings. Hello, Senior Rod. This is Ernesto, the caretaker of your country house. Oh, yes. Ernesto, what can I do for you? Is there a problem? Um, I'm just calling to advise you, Senor Rod, that your parrot is dead. <laughs> My parrot dead? The one that I, the one that, that won the international competition? See, si, Senor, that's the one. <clears throat> Darn, that's a pity. I spent a small fortune on that bird. What did he die from? From eating the rotten meat, Senor Rod. Rotten meat? Who fed him rotten meat? Nobody, senor. He ate the meat of the dead horse. <coughs> dead horse? What dead horse? <coughs> the thoroughbred, senor Rod. My prize, thoroughbred, is dead? Yes, senor Rod. He died from all that work pulling the water cart. Oh. Are you insane? What water cart? The one we used to put out the fire, senor. Oh. <laughs> Great Lord, what fire are you talking about, man? The one at your house, senor, a candle fell and the curtains caught on fire. What, are you saying that my mansion is destroyed because of the candle? Yeah. Yes, senor Rod. But there's electricity at the house. What was the candle for? For the funeral, senor oh, Rod. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> what funeral? Your wife's, senor Rod. Oh. She showed up very late one night and I thought she was a thief, so I hit her with their new tailor-made Super Quad 460 golf club. <laughs> Long silence. Ernesto, if you broke that driver, you're in big trouble. <laughs> well, what's important to you? What are your priorities? Now, I don't golf a lot, but I'm going to do a little more golfing, I think, after I'm retired. But I'll still try to do more fishing than I do golfing. But I haven't done a lot of fishing in the last uh, couple of years. But I hope that I don't turn out to be like this picture shows. <coughs> second letter to the church at Corinth. Um, this is the church that the apostle established when he was on one of his missionary journeys. And he makes it clear that too many people in the church had too many different ideas of what the church should be and what the priorities should be and who they should really listen to and whether they could actually trust the apostle himself. And this resulted in anger and division and slanderings, and disorder, and so he had to speak quite sharply to them. He used very harsh words, aiming to set right what was wrong. He makes a strong case for the fact that he has spoken God's word, he's told the truth, 
even when it was painful to do so. Then he comes to the end of the letter, and he draws his message to a close with gentle, loving words, making an appeal to them, <coughs> exhorting them, which, if they should heed, would result in the church that would be more what it was intended by God to be, as a reflection of the one they claim to serve, even Jesus Christ. And this is what he says in his concluding word. Finally, brethren, farewell. Mend your ways, heed my appeal, agree with one another, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And I thought those would be appropriate words to conclude my time here uh, in this pulpit. Um, because I think there are some things that uh, are very important uh, that Paul says to the church of Corinth and still important for the church of today. He uses the word finally. Now back in those days when a letter of Paul's arrived at a church, they would read it out loud to the whole congregation. And I'm sure that when he, whoever was reading it, came to this point where it said, finally, there might have been some in the congregation who, knowing Paul, might have said, oh yeah, sure, <laughs> finally. We've heard that before. Um, if you will read through his letters, you'll find that it, on several occasions, partway through the letter, he'll say, finally. Finally rejoice, as he did with the Philippians in the third chapter. And then he goes on and on and on. And then in the fourth chapter, it says, finally, again. And then he goes on and on and on, and finally he concludes it. Well, he preached to the people, and probably that was what he would do once in a while. Uh, I know I've been guilty of that. When I was in Junction City, one of the elders there, Ken Dunn was his name. We have some Junction City folks here today. They knew Ken. Ken was a wonderful man, a wonderful elder, lived on a farm up River Road. Um, and I loved him. He was always very helpful and encouraging to me. But he liked to set me straight every now and then. <laughs> and quite often, he would hang around after the service and then he'd come up to me and want to discuss a point that I'd made. Um, or he would say, that was a very interesting story. I'm going to have to think some more about that and talk to you more about that. And I remember one Sunday, he came up to me afterwards and he said, you know, in that sermon, that was pretty good sermon, you, you came to a good stopping place there in your sermon, and you brought us to a real high, but you didn't stop. <laughs> he said, you kept on going, you brought us back down again, and he said, you really should have quit while you were ahead. <laughs> since then. I figure I've preached around 410 sermons or so in this <coughs> church since I've been with you over these almost nine years. This is my, quote, finally sermon. <laughs> Although I'm not through preaching, uh, my preacher son in Silverton, whose wife made it down, this morning, and uh, he's up there preaching in Silverton, but uh, anyway, he'll be here later, but anyway, um, he's already tied me down for when, one Sunday next month when he's going to be gone. <laughs> but uh, I'm through preaching in Glenwood, I'm through baptizing, I'm through weddings and funerals here at Glenwood. You will have a new pastor. Accept, respect, and appreciate your new leader as you have done me. Amen. 
this word finally reminds me of the story that was um, of a pastor who, like me, was closing out his ministry. The announcement in the bulletin said, the pastor will preach his final sermon today, after which the choir will sing, break forth into joy. <laughs> Here in verse 11 of this 13th chapter of 2 Corinthians, the Apostle says, Finally, brethren, farewell. The words for parting in most languages suggest not so much separation as the implied hope of meeting again. And many of these words uh, demonstrate confidence in God's guidance or a fond wish for future well-being. The French, adieu, means I commend you to God. The German, auf Wiedersehen, till we meet again. Our word goodbye is actually a contraction of the phrase God be with you. The English word here, um, which is a translation from the Greek word is farewell, it means may things go well with you, or may you have a pleasant journey. And so, finally, my brother, <coughs> as Nancy and I say farewell to this church, this is our desire for you, that things will go well for you. We desire the very best for this church. Change. Sometimes it's difficult, but it's often a very good thing for a person and for a church. Change is inevitable. It's going to happen. I'm praying that with a new personality in this pulpit, a younger personality, I assume that whoever you hire is going to be younger than this guy, <laughs> <laughs> that there will be a new, fresh breeze of God's Spirit filling this place. Be open to that. Expect that. Give your full-hearted support of that. Following his word of farewell, Paul listed several actions on their part that would assure good results in the church there at Corinth. First of all, he says, mend your ways. Another translation puts it, aim for perfection. Some of you might remember the old movie, The Wizard of Oz. Um, and at the time in that movie when Toto, the little dog, grabs a hold of a curtain screen and pulls it open, <coughs> revealing this old man speaking into a microphone, pretending to be a wizard. Mm -hmm. And Dorothy says to him, you are a very bad man. He replies, oh no, my dear, I'm really a very good man but I'm a very bad wizard. <laughs> you may have noticed the quotation I posted on the outdoor sign recently, not original with me. It says, I've learned two things. There is a God. I'm not him. <laughs> Paul's words, mend your ways, reminds us that we still have a lot of growing to do, all of us, in our lives as Christians. We've not yet arrived. We're not wizards, we're not gods. We can identify with Paul's words in the church of Philippi when he said, not that I have already obtained this, or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Mend your ways. And then he says, agree with one another. Or as the message, quote, the message version, puts it, think in harmony. Think in harmony. One Sunday morning, a minister said to his congregation, we will now repeat the 23rd Psalm. He had had them all memorize it. And then he said, will the lady who generally gets to the still waters while the rest of us are in green pastures, <laughs> kindly wait and go with the flock? <laughs> This church is made up of a large variety of people, which is true in every church. 
who have different abilities, different personalities, different opinions, different gifts, different looks, different strengths, and weaknesses. And that's the way it is, and the way it should be. Different is beautiful. The wonder of it all is that we can come together with all of our differences and still be one in the Spirit, one in the Lord. We can think together on the same thing. We can work together toward the same goal. We can walk together in the same direction. We can pray together for the same results and dream together the same kind of dreams. Togetherness, harmony, oneness. A definite key to a congregation's strength is its unity. And indeed, in the words of one of our historical mottos as a church, Disciples of Christ, in essentials unity, in non-essentials liberty, in all things love. And then, not only does he say, mend your ways and think in harmony, but also live in peace. Or as the message translation version puts it, be agreeable. You may disagree, but you can be agreeable. You may see eye to eye with some others in the congregation, and then not see eye to eye at other times about other subjects or themes or projects, whatever it might be. But get along, forgiving, accepting, loving, always seeking to keep a peaceful atmosphere in the church, as I believe we have maintained beautifully throughout these last years. There are some churches that get bad reputations because uh, they're fighting about this or that all the time. And that's tragic when the church takes on that kind of a reputation. I have found for myself that one of the essential characteristics of a minister, what we have to be in order to continue in the work that God has called us to do is to be a peaceable kind of person. Um, if I'm if throughout the years I've been argumentative and always finding fault and, and uh, not seeing eye to eye ever with anybody else and always wanting to demand my own way, um, I wouldn't have lasted as long as I have in this, this particular call. I wonder after I retire if I might, though, be like the fellow that William Willimon described. It was his own father-in-law, William Willimon, a very outstanding pastor, written a lot, of, a lot of books. And he tells about his father-in-law, Mr. Parker, <coughs> who spent his entire life as a pastor in a variety of United Methodist churches in South Carolina. Mr. Parker had thus spent his life in black suits and white shirts, as a moral exemplar of the community, doing his duty in the weekend and week out uh, care of his church. When he retired, he bought a large camping trailer, and he and Mrs. Parker pulled the trailer toward New England for a long-awaited retirement celebration trip. Somehow, on the way from South Carolina to New England, he got confused and he ended up in the middle of Manhattan, pulling this trailer. A car blew its horn at him, pulled up beside him, and the driver <coughs> shouted through his open window, Old man, I wish you would figure out where you're going or get out of the way. <laughs> Wilmon says that his father-in-law said that he thought to himself, I'm up here in New York, a long way from South Carolina. Nobody here knows that I was a Methodist preacher and that I'm retired. And so he yelled back out the window to the man who was driving next to him. And he said, and I wish you would go to hell. <laughs> <laughs> 
will go with you, it says, and I will give you rest. And God did. And Moses did. And the Israelites did. And they gave it to the promised land. Here's a great strengthening promise for us still today. When John Wesley was about to pass from this life into his eternal promised land, he said, the best of all, God is with us. He knew God had been with him throughout his life. God was going to be with him now as he went through this, this period of passing from one life to the other. In life and in death, I will be with you, he was promised. God has been with us here at Glenwood throughout these years. Blessed our word. And we've seen some wonderful things happen. Yes, we've had our struggles and our difficulties along the way. But it's been a good work. And we have known God has been with us. Paul exhorts the church in one other sentence here in this passage. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Today, if he were writing the same letter, he would say greet one another perhaps with a holy hug or a firm, friendly handshake. There are many ways to demonstrate love for others. We know within families there are uh, some very unique ways. In my family, uh, and I'm so glad to have quite a few in my family here today, and uh, my daughter, Robbie, is one that uh, lets her love be shown in so many different ways. When she was a little girl, she always used to, uh, to do this for me. Uh, she would sneak into the church and into my office when I wasn't there, and she would she would write a note, "I love you, Dad," and then she would put it in a place, kind of hide it, but knowing that I would eventually find it, and I always did, and it always made my day. She's 52 years old now. She was visiting at the house here just a few months ago, and then. When she was gone, I was, I don't remember just exactly when it was, but sometime I was in my study going through things and I lifted up something and there was a note. <laughs> Dad, I love you. Your girl. And it's set up where I can see it every day now. Um, and, uh, you know, that's the way she, one of the ways, 
many ways that she demonstrates her love for her old man. <laughs> and she's still my little girl. And so in our families and in the church, there are unique and wonderful ways that we can demonstrate our love for one another. Love makes all the difference in a family and in the church. A while ago, we sang the song, Bind us together, Lord. Bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. Bind us together, Lord. Bind us together. Bind us together in love. May that continue to be the kind of song that you sing and the kind of experience that you have here in this church. Keep loving. Keep serving. Keep in harmony. Press on with the Apostle Paul toward the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And the blessings will go on. Shall we pray? O oh Lord, I have heard it said, do and be done. And the former is far the easiest. And now for all that has been, thanks. And for all